Hi, everyone. I'm Courtney Young, co-founder and CEO of Myogene Bio, a startup that's dedicated to developing cutting-edge therapies for muscle diseases, starting with a gene editing therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Duchenne is a really devastating muscle-wasting disease caused by genetic mutations and resulting in progressive muscle weakness. Boys with Duchenne typically lose the ability to walk in their early teens and then die in their 20s or 30s. And there's currently no cure and only limited approved therapies. This is a rare disease, but still has potential for a large market opportunity. This photo on the right is my cousin Christopher, who was diagnosed with Duchenne in 2008, which is what got me into the field. And he represents the patients that inspire us, because he's going to die in 10 to 15 years, unless we have more effective therapies for this disease. Duchenne is caused by genetic mutations that result in the puzzle pieces of DNA no longer fitting together, highlighted in the red box. This makes the gene non-functional, so no dystrophin protein is produced, leading to premature death. We've developed this solution called Myodis 4555 that uses state-of-the-art gene editing, specifically AAV delivery of CRISPR, to permanently delete a region of the gene so that the puzzle pieces fit together again and allowing for the dystrophin protein to be expressed. This region encompasses about half of all patient mutations and is expected to lead to a longer, more normal life in Duchenne. This is just an example of some of our preclinical data. On the top is what normal dystrophin staining looks like. In the middle is the Duchenne model that doesn't express dystrophin. And after we've treated the Duchenne model with our therapy, we're able to restore the dystrophin protein in green. Some of the benefits of this approach is that it's permanently changing the patient's own DNA. It's applicable for 50% of patients compared to other approaches that only target 13% or less. And it creates a larger, more functional protein than what's expressed in other types of gene therapy, which only expresses a protein about a third the size of normal, whereas ours is 87% the protein size. We did our academic research at UCLA during my PhD and postdoc, and we have an exclusive license agreement for the underlying IP. We're currently in preclinical development funded by grants, aiming to get to our pre-IND and then IND filing in 2025, completing our preclinical studies before advancing to human clinical trials. My co-founders include Melissa Spencer and April Pyle, professors at UCLA where we did the initial development. And then in Myogene, we have an additional five employees, consultants, and scientific and business advisors. We're currently raising a seed round, supplementing our ongoing grants to advance our preclinical development where we have a lead investor identified. In summary, Myogene is developing this important gene editing therapy for Duchenne. We plan to expand our portfolio into other muscle diseases to build Myogene as a muscle disease therapeutics company to help boys like my cousin Christopher. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Awesome. <laughs> Judges, would you like to go first? I guess I will ask first question. Um, can you elaborate a little more about the IP part? What is particularly uh, the intellectual property for this? Yeah, so the IP was filed around this specific target in the DMD gene, which encompasses exons 45 to 55, so making a large exon 45 to 55 deletion, as well as the specific guide RNA sequences that are used um, in our approach to make this deletion. So it's specific to the DMD gene applicable to Duchenne or Becker patients within this region, but for basically the specific target, um, as well as the guide RNA sequences. Um, and when you are saying you, you are planning to expand the technologies to other disorders, um, if, uh, if this is specific to this disorder, then um, how is it going to expand to other fields? Yeah, so each you know, gene target and, and DNA target will be unique IP. And the idea would be able to take a deletion like this approach that we can use in Duchenne and other muscle diseases that are also caused by structural proteins or where you need to make a deletion to restore the function of the gene. So basically using the idea of making a large deletion in a gene to restore function. And that can be applied to other types of like limb girdle, muscular dystrophy, myotonic, FSHD that type of thing, but the, you know, there'd be new IP developed for each of those approaches. Um, so like the idea is kind of what the idea is, is that can be applied, but each target will be unique for each gene. Yeah. How long is the sequence? So what we delete in the DMD gene is 700 KB in a wild type gene. 
So patients can have different mutations. We've done up to 725 KB, but it's a very large deletion. How frequent is the dosing? How many doses do you uh, administer? Yeah, that's a great question. So in our preclinical studies, we've compared doing you know, a single injection as well as using immune suppression to dampen the immune response to give repeated injections. We've shown that if you do that and you give two injections instead of one injection, you can double the amount of dystrophin that's restored in less well-targeted tissues like skeletal muscle, but tissues that are really well-targeted like the heart, it didn't have a, a significant difference in. So um, I think ultimately in terms of clinical development, it'll depend on the age of the patient um, and how effective it is in those studies. You know, because it's a permanent change, you have potential to have a really long-lasting therapy, but um, you know, treating a young patient that's going to grow a lot or if you don't reach kind of a threshold level of dystrophin, you might want to be able to redose. So um, it's a little uncertain in terms of the clinical development, but what we've done in mice is comparing one versus, versus two injections. And are you going to go to younger in your trial, planned trials? Is it younger population or uh, yeah, so older children? We plan to target younger patients, you know, like age three to six, because in Duchenne, patients can actually kind of maintain their muscle and kind of even still improve some function until around age seven, then they begin to decline and lose muscle mass. And because we're restoring dystrophin in muscle that's present, we need intact muscle in order to have an efficacious therapy. I think ultimately for older patients, you'll really need a combination therapy where you have something that can restore dystrophin like our approach, but also something to build muscle, reduce fibrosis, because once that muscle has been replaced um, by fat and fibrotic tissue, it's really hard to reverse that. And is the 7 million going to take you through phase one, or is it just IND enabling and starting phase one? Yeah, so that's just to get to IND enabling, yeah. Um, uh, great presentation, by the way, and a great pitch. Uh, I thought it was very well put together. On one of the slides, you mentioned a, a competitor's uh, kind of solution. It seemed like an even more truncated uh, DND gene. Is that one single competitor? Or have, you, have you identified further competitors in the field, or do you have any more information on that competitor? Yeah, so the mini and micro dystrophins, that, that size of dystrophin that's about a third the size of normal, is being developed by four other companies that are doing gene replacement gene therapy. So the dystrophin protein is really large, and it doesn't fit into AAV, which is what everyone's currently using to deliver gene replacement. And so they've engineered these mini and micro ones that are very, very small. So those companies are Solid, Sarepta, Pfizer, and Regenix Bio. They all have these proteins that are about a third the size of normal because they're you know, putting in this artificial construct to replace it in this mini version, whereas we're editing the endogenous DNA to restore one that's much larger than that. Um, in terms of you know, other people using CRISPR, most of the focus in Duchenne has been using um, single exon targets. We target 11 exons. Most people target just one exon, and that means their patient population target is only 13%, whereas we can encompass a hotspot of 50%. And we always make this, um, you know, the same type of dystrophin, which is linked to improved function in, in other patients. Um, so those are kind of the main um, differences in terms of those competitors. But yeah, that miniaturized version is being used by multiple other companies. Got it. And yeah. Have you looked at, have you analyzed like the underlying IP on, from those companies in particular? Yeah, so the um, kind of IP approach is different depending on the therapeutic approach. So kind of the idea of um, you know, delivering that replacement construct um, doesn't involve using CRISPR. So um, that's kind of this engineered vector that carries this replacement gene. Um, the IP around the single exon strategies was all similar to what I was discussing, where the guide RNAs and the you know, target exons are what's covered by that IP. And then kind of the underlying CRISPR IP will likely need to license for use sure. in a human therapeutic um, at, when we're ready for that. Um, quick follow-up questions um, for me is that, how far along are those competitors that you just named? So the mini and micro dystrophin approaches, and I think I probably have a slide if it's helpful, um, are, um, currently in clinical trials, so that's the second from the bottom row here that used that very small version of the gene. Um, the Sarepta gene replacement one just was uh, going up for accelerated approval, so that is pending. Um, the other gene editing approaches are all preclinical um, where we are as well. And how have, um, 
I'm just trying to see, do you have their efficacy on, okay. Yeah, so the, the efficacy studies in the gene replacement trials um, have shown some benefit, but not, have, have not met their primary endpoint of statistically improved function across the you know, full ages that were treated. So the Sarepta study did um, post hoc analysis on a subset of patients and showed statistically improved um, function, but the you know, primary outcome measure was technically not met in their placebo-controlled trial. Um, but they were seeing restoration of the protein, which is the first step. Thank you. Yep. So maybe uh, a higher level question. Um, if you can imagine after 2030, uh, w would this therapy be granted orphan drug status and how many patients globally would have access to the therapy? Yeah, so we do expect that it could get orphan drug access. Um, and you know, right now, the incidence of Duchenne is about one in 5,000 patients, 5,000 boys that are born each year. Um, in the U.S. and Europe, it's a total of like 30 to 50,000 patients. So if you scale that, it's you know maybe a couple hundred thousand patients in total. And our approach is applicable for half of those with this initial approach. Um, so that would be the overall target market. And, and who do you imagine would would pay for this outside the U.S.? This would be governments that would pay for. I'm guessing what would be a very expensive therapy. Right. Exactly. I think you know we'll be learning with the current other approaches for gene therapy how they're going to deal with market access in other countries because yes, all the gene therapies are very expensive. Um, so I think we'll be learning with those that are ahead of us how best to navigate that. But um, potentially governments, um, potentially working with nonprofits, you know that type of thing. It, it also brings up the question about where do you see this product uh, fitting in the treatment paradigm, right? Will other less expensive therapies be used first? Just give them a shot before spending money on perhaps more expensive therapies, you know, these kinds of things. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be curious to see where, where you'd fit in here. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, ultimately, the overall goal would be to have a combination therapy, um, which using some of the other ones that address some of the downstream side effects to bolster the efficacy of this therapy, because the only other ones that currently can restore dystrophin that are approved are these exon skipping approaches, and they're not very effective. They only restore very small amounts of the protein, so we still need something that's effective at restoring dystrophin. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. There is one. Yeah, go ahead, Albert. So are, are you at all concerned about repeated dosing of an AAV-based approach? And um, to what extent are the, um, I guess, the one clinical program is a single dose? So how do you sort of compare repeated dosing in, in the realm of AAVs? Yeah, so in our preclinical studies, we can only achieve repeated dosing if we use a strong immune suppression cocktail that really dampens the immune response to the first dose. And we also think that's important for safety because a lot of adverse events seen with gene therapy are caused by this immune response. So our current approach is to give this stronger cocktail like a B cell depleting drug and a T cell inhibitor with the first dose so that you can prevent that initial immune response from developing. Um, and in mice, we've shown that that allows for repeated dosing. In the first in human study, it would likely just be that single dose to assess safety. But then if needed, the idea of redosing with this immune suppression cocktail is what would be um, used because, yeah, alone it's, you know, giving it AV is currently not effective multiple times. You need these other approaches. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.